His creativity and musical genius remain a vital influence on hip hop to this day, one of the true greats of the music and culture. But 20 years later, the murder of Notorious B.I.G. remains one of hip hop's most troubling mysteries. Christopher Wallace, better known as hip hop superstar Notorious B.I.G. The Brooklyn-born rapper was 24 years old and at the height of his platinum-selling popularity when he was gunned down in Los Angeles on March 9, 1997. He was coming out of an award show after party. His best friend Lil C's, who was 17 at the time, says they didn't see it coming. They play hypnotize in there like 10 times. Everybody was showing love, going crazy, and the we movie. didn't get no threats. It wasn't nobody throwing up no west side at us. It was just really just totally cool. Nothing happened until we walked outside and got in that truck and stopped at that red light. And that car just pulled up out of nowhere and just started firing shots in our truck. Biggie was in the front passenger seat of the SUV and died about an hour later. The LAPD launched an investigation, but the department was in turmoil due to a gang-related corruption scandal. At one point, they came to New York, says former NYPD Lieutenant Darren Porcher, who was involved with the case. The LAPD came to the came to New York City and they met with a contingent of officers within the NYPD because they were trying to assess who um, Christopher Wallace knew here in New York City. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Biggie's murder broke the hearts of his fans, many who saw his rap to riches story as an inspiration for their own lives. Thousands lined the streets of Brooklyn for his funeral procession, too many for the service, which attracted former Mayor David Dinkins and Queen Latifah. Two decades later, no one has ever been arrested and charged in his death. Witnesses and video of the shooting only took investigators so far. One of Sean Combs' bodyguards, for example, um, Gene Deal, he made an identification that, yes, this was the person that I saw that was the shooter in this case. It was a male black, um, blue suit, blue bow tie. We do have video to show this individual, but we don't have video to show the actual shooter. Lil C says Biggie was on the verge of a new life and leaving old beefs and street drama behind. Now let's find out more about what Biggie was really like from those who knew him best, and they're with us here in studio. Joining us, Miranda Johnson. She's a multimedia hip-hop journalist, former digital producer for Double XL Magazine. Miranda, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Also with us is Lil C's. He's a hip-hop artist, member of Junior Mafia, Biggie's best friend from back in the day. Thank you so much for being no with doubt, us, Cease. What's going on? Good to have you back. We really right, appreciate likewise. it. Also with us, Hot 97's own uh, DJ Enough. He's also the Hot 97 Mix Show coordinator, the CEO of the Heavy Hitters, and he also DJ'd on tour with Biggie, so we got to know him really, really well. But Cease, I want to start with you. Oh. Biggie the man, what, as your, as your friend, what are the things that people don't really know about him? Uh, what people don't know about Big, probably his sense of humor how funny he was. Mm -hmm. Enough could tell you that. Mm -hmm. Just being on the road, cracking jokes, and always bugging out, pranking pranking on each other. You know, when we used to smoke weed, I used to hide from him and go <laughs> lock myself in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, just, for, uh, just to try to stay calm and stay normal. But he had found a way to get in the bathroom and put matches. He used to put matches between our fingers and light them and leave the room. So by the time that match burned down to your skin, you woke up, you're in the room by yourself, you done think you done tripped out and uh, got super high before. But he was just real funny, just real, like, got a sense of humor, funny, always cracking jokes and chilling and uh, always looking out for his peoples, too. That was one thing I, I know everybody noticed. Is that putting, he always looked out for the people that were around enough? Just sure. give us a sense of what the, what the music scene, the hip-hop scene, was very different in the 1990s. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was uh, it was boom bap, but I think uh, with the marriage of Big and Puff, you know, Puff got to put a little polish on Biggie. You know, Biggie came from from the the hood, from Brooklyn, and it was hardcore. You know, it was MOP back in those days. It was uh, Wu Tang, Wu Tang, Smith and Wesson, and I remember him. He kept he always said, "I want to I want to make records like Snoop, you know, and Dre." Like he wanted that big clarity sound. So um, I think Puff and Puff and, and him got to do that, and I think. Um, 
as much as sometimes even like during the days I should be like, oh, we're not going to polish him up. But that polish, I think, is what took him to the next level. Love it. You know what I'm saying? And, and it really Mar did. Miranda, what about that? Because that was also an era for New York rap when it was very heavily lyric. It was about the lyrics. Right. It was about your spitting skills. It was about all of that. And not as much about the beat and the rhythm. But Biggie kind of merged the two. Absolutely. Um, the Notorious B.I.G. was a, a rap phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I mean, he literally taught people how to take that everyday life in the hood and make it, you know, luxury. He introduced them to a whole bunch of brands that they didn't know, had everyone wearing Kooji. He just made, like, you know, the, the everyday um, hood individual kind of, you know, just want more and aspire for more. So that, that's kind of what Biggie was, you know, focusing on and kind of what he really had an impact on. See, is it true he went to Catholic school? Yeah. yeah that's where he learned yeah. it. His mom said that's where Miss Wallace said that. That's where he learned to write so well. <laughs> like, so when you hear them rhymes and you hear him using these uh, these words, you would... Cause he was he was smart he was sharp he was in school like Big was a nerd he was a he didn't come outside <laughs> for a that. while till like he was that. like 15 16 years old really Miss yeah, Wallace kept him away from Fulton Street cause she was he very came, strict yeah and then once he got a little older you know what I mean and one of his friends Chico had took him around on Fulton Street that it was, was over it, it was me. over <laughs> he came around and, and that's also to Brooklyn when Brooklyn wasn't trendy it was yeah. like Brooklyn was oh no bro, Brooklyn was man and Brooklyn Ben Stuy was, was, was yeah, very Brooklyn rough was bad there was still bad to build there was, there was no hipsters in Brooklyn at that time Sorry. It, it, it was just the homies. That was about it. You know what I mean? But it was real rough. It was a lot of poverty. It was a lot of stuff going on in there. And I think that's where he had that edge at, being smart and being sharp and going to school and then getting the edge of going in them streets helped balance him. That's why when you hear So he had the two things. So the people that don't really know him and don't know the history, and they just see kind of what they call the gangster, right. this this thugged out type of image. That's not really who he was. No. He was raised by a very strict mother who was a school teacher. Right, right. She wasn't playing as well as a strict. To this day, she's still strict. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. You know, it's unfortunate that you, you only get to see Biggie smile one time, and that's during the Hypnotize video. Yeah. All the other videos, any footage, any documentation of any sort, there's nothing of him smiling. Like that big, beautiful smile. Right. Right. And it's it's unfortunate, but we've yeah. got to see we that. We saw it all day. We, you know all the time. All the time. You know, and it's it's sad, you know, after the fact. But that, that boy's smile was incredible and infectious. And I, I wish the world got to see more of that. That's the last thing you're thinking. It's like, I'm, I'm about to walk out of here. My homeboy truck is about to get shot up. He's about to die. Let's talk about what happened, you know, 20 years ago. How did I remember where I was and how I got that phone call? What, on March 9th, 1997, mm -hmm. that this this had happened and the word spread and we all rushed down to Hot 97 to the station to just deal with it and find out what was going on because mm -hmm. there was no social media in 1997 no, like that. Not. So you had to really go in person and just right. show up. But enough, where were you when For that me, happened? For me, I was home sleeping. My brother-in-law at the time, uh, Will, woke me up and was like, yo, turn on the radio, man. Um, I think your man got killed, and, and he, he didn't even want to tell me. And I was like, "What?" Um, and I didn't get a I didn't get a, a call from C's and Kim yet. It was it was before that, and I was just I was lost, and I broke down, started crying, and then about ten minutes later, uh, I spoke to was it Rock? I think it was Rock, Rock, you and Little Kim at the same time, and they were all at the hospital, and they called me, and we we were just screaming at the top of our lungs, and. We can't believe it, our guy is lost. And I, we, I was just stuck. It, it, the crazy part is, I don't even remember asking them what happened. You know how usually you, right. you ask somebody, well, what happened? Right. We didn't even ask what happened, because I, in my mind, and I, I told Caesar about this yesterday, I had this pre-notion like this guy was gonna pass away. You did? I did, I was telling D-Rock before he even, I said, I said, just watch our boy, man. Because, you know, look, listen, let's be honest. During it was that very time, tense. During that time, it was very tense. We got a lot of... Um, a lot of violence. A lot of threatened... Uh, what's, what's those called? Death threats. Crank Death calls. threats, yeah. crank calls. All that stuff was real. And for me, you know, you know, if Big and Puff and everybody wanted to go celebrate and do the album, you know, they still should have been allowed to do that. But I just had this feeling it was going to happen. And when it happened, it just broke my heart. And season, this was against the backdrop of a, of a time where the, the East Coast, West Coast beef was at its highest. Yeah. You didn't have rappers traveling around to other cities and other regions right. like you do today. You you were there. You were in Los Angeles. Tell, yeah. tell us what, what your experience was. I was in the car. Uh, I was in the car with him. So right. uh, I was uh, in the seat behind him. And, uh, you know, you didn't see it coming. We didn't expect it. Now, we was out there for uh, almost two months just doing promo. He was uh, he was working on Puff album. He was helping Puff with some of his records for his album. And we opposed it with the London, I think, two days before that. 
but they were trying to send just me and him there. He was just like, yo, I'm not, who gonna do my flights and tickets and hotels, Lil C's? Like, come right, on, like, right. I'm not gonna do that. He's like, yo, I'd do anything to not go. And we were just like, Puff was like, all right, well, you wanna work? He was like, yeah, I work. So we kind of just sat back and we just he was just finishing up. He did the Benjamins, uh, right. he did the Benjamins remix, he did right. that verse, and he did uh, the Victory verse right. for Puff album. And then we, he just wanted to go out and hang out one day. And I, to this day, I wish I would have just told him no, because he asked me and D-Rock, like, yo, what's up? Y'all want to roll out tonight? And we were just like, yo, you, you, you big papa. It's, it's, we out here with you. What you but wasn't do? that the, the awards? It was the awards, yeah, and then yeah, they broke, and there were like thousands awards. of people, yeah, Soul Train weekend. Awards. Yeah, it was that weekend. And um, I think we were sitting in front of, uh, Andre Herrera had a party at this, uh, at this mansion out there in the hills. And Big was like, you know, I ain't been out in a few days. Let's go have some drinks and go chill. And we wound up going to the uh, the, uh, the museum, museum to the vibe party, mm -hmm. which right, is, which is where they had the party. Yeah. And then they left, and then you guys left. Yep, we left, and uh, at, and it wasn't no problems either. Like they played hypnotize in there like ten times. Everybody was showing love, going crazy, and the we movies. didn't get no threats. It wasn't nobody throwing up no West Side at us. It was just really just totally cool. Nothing happened until we walked outside and got in that truck and stopped at that red light. And that car just pulled up out of nowhere and just started firing shots in our truck. To the side of the truck? Yeah, we was in the middle lane. It was like three lanes. And once we pulled out the uh, from under the parking lot, we got caught at that light right there. So whoever must have came must have got, got through that traffic from everybody pulling out the parking lot. And he just rolled up on the side of us, didn't say nothing, didn't yell nothing, just came and just started firing in the door, in Biggie door. I was right behind him. I jumped out, touching myself, thinking I got shot. Because I, right, I was literally right behind him. He was in the passenger seat, and I was in the back seat behind him. So there was nothing like at the party, like you said. There was nobody throwing up a set sign. Nah. Nobody, nobody, you know, looking at you sideways totally, or totally smooth. I mean, you know, we was out there for two months, so we used to get little, we used to get little people like you know, little jesters throwing West Side. We went to the mall and stuff like that. But it was real light stuff, you right? Know you know, and Big just wanted to be there. You know, everybody was like, why he was out there. That was Big calling. He wanted to go there. He wanted big to be love there. Cali. He enjoyed it. You know, big what love saying? Cali. And we was moving around. One like we just stayed in places. Like we was, we was all over. We was hanging out. We was going to eat. We was going to clubs. He was hanging out. We was kicking it with Daz. We was kicking it with Corrupt. We'd go see Snoop every now and then. Like we was out there actually hanging out. He was working too, promoting the Life at the Death album and promoting the single. So. You so know, you were part of the lifestyle and enjoying the lifestyle. It wasn't like you were holed up in the studio or in a hotel room the yeah, whole time. Yeah, nah, nah. We was out there. You know, we was out there having the ball, having fun. We was flying to Frisco to, to the Bay, going to do the stations out there, doing promo. Right. You know, back in them days, we were still doing meet and greets. You know, you're going right. to the store. <laughs> right. There was no, you, you know had to do real, like, yeah. you had to do you real, had to, really to promote an album, you couldn't just, it wasn't just putting something no, on Instagram no. or Snapchat. We didn't have that. You had to go in person, it, it had to be manually. You know, right. nowadays kids have a lot of advantage to, to this day. They to the digital thing. They video right off their phone. Right. They but they're everything, right and it, it was, everything was very personal, and yeah. I think that added a lot to the, the tensions that were there. But when you, after you jumped out of that truck and you heard those gunshots, then what happened? And then we went back, we, we went to the back of the truck just for a minute just to cover and then we realized big door didn't open and we all ran back to the car and he was just like leaning over the console of the seat just with his eyes just like wide open like just like just with that shock look like he couldn't believe what happened and he didn't yell he didn't say nothing there was no words from him and we all just jumped back in the truck and puff got in our car and we just drove to the hospital to try so to just completely lights. out of nowhere yeah just out of nowhere we didn't see that coming you know what I mean? We didn't think it was going to happen. But a few people were seeing things from around there. You know, D-Rock, they were seeing certain people just moving around the parking lot that were just, like, real suspect. But you're not thinking nothing. You're not thinking. That's the, that's the last thing you're thinking about. All right, somebody about to shoot at our truck as soon as we get out this parking lot. You right, know, and you, and you always have people, anytime there's a big event and there's celebrities, you always right. have people kind of, like, yeah, trying to catch a glimpse they, and yeah, they take a look the place at them. Down. You know, they just shut it down because it was too crowded. So it, it, it was a bunch of Muslim security. It's regular security. It's the police. It's the fire department. That's the last thing you're thinking. It's like, I'm... I'm about to walk out of here. My homeboy truck is about to get shot up. He's about to die. Like that was just like totally off off the blue. We didn't we didn't see that coming at all. And to this day, to this day, nobody's been arrested for that murder. Nah. There have been all kinds of different theories and investigations and things like that. But does that bother you as his friend, as somebody that just was so close to him? Of course, of course. You know, I, I want that justice for his moms. You know what I'm saying, Miss Wallace. She that was her only son. Right. And she's been fighting for that justice. To this day, you know what I mean? Like she, she wants she she wants somebody responsible for that. She wants them to, you know, she she wants some justice from that. And that's what I'm fighting for.
there's a whole thing, you know, the, with the, the rappers from that era, everybody had kind of like the notebook and they were writing in the notebook and people would pull out their notebooks and like, I write my own lyrics and right. here they are and right. this, this is what they are. But people see, would say that Biggie would just, you know, get a little lift on and then he would just freestyle and get, <laughs> get a couple beats and then yeah. go at it. It's true. Is that it. true? true? Yes, that's very true. In the beginning, uh, he wrote, it was, some, it was some rhymes on paper from uh, Ready to Die. Like, I remember seeing Warning on paper, you know what I mean? But by the time he got to Life After Death and the end of Ready to Die, no more pen and paper. He would just write it all in his head. We would sit in the studio, and you'd just think he's not working. We'd all be in there smoking and drinking, and the, the beat would be loud for about two hours. And he'd just get up and go, all right, I'm ready. And do three verses, ad libs, hook. Yo, he would do this nasty shit. He would, I'm going to talk. his nose. Yo, he would do like, some. <laughs> And then he would yeah. do some with his ear, <laughs> and I'd be like, "What is he doing?" But, it, but right, he did yeah. that. He so did some that. weird, like, like, like he cleaned something, and then, like, and like, then all of a sudden he'd be ready, and I'd be like, like turning on a machine or a computer. Like, what, what was that? It's no rhymes. It's no rhymes on paper of life after death. That album. No he just did it all out of his head. Miranda, is that unusual? Uh, that's absolutely unusual. There's so many rappers today that when you put them on the spot, they can't even freestyle. Um, I just know, just from participating in Double Double XL Freshman, that when they do the freestyles there, a lot of the rappers come with them already written, so mm. they're not kind of freestyle. Yeah. So for him to freestyle a whole album, that is remarkable. Right. And, and with the hooks and everything yeah, already just, played. Yeah, and it was memory too. He would just lock it in. Like he would sit there for two, three hours, but you would just think he's just like not doing nothing. You're just like, all right, we're yeah, he's just chilling. Yeah, but I could see it because it's like almost like if you're an actor or actress, right? You have to remember those lines if you're uh, yeah. performing at a, a play or if you're doing uh, lines for a movie. So maybe he was just doing that same kind of technique in his in his brain while the while the beat. Because he would have it set up. It would already be like set in his head. Like when you hear, you just know like all right, he he already had that in there. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. But he just memorized it. He would just go in there and just mm -hmm. and, and just lay it down. It, but it, he would have it all structured together. Like it's already already the like this. With, right, the because hook, it sounds like so organized. And, yeah. And, but what about up. what about the the storytelling? aspect of it, Miranda, in terms of his, his lyrics and, and the impact that that's had on rap. Biggie was one of the greatest storytellers hip-hop has ever seen. Uh, you find so many of his lyrics in songs today. Like, if you just take Juicy alone, I can name over 30 different songs that rappers have pulled lines from Juicy yeah. and, and put it in their That's own crazy. song. That's you crazy. That's crazy. Uh, uh, Little Wayne and Birdman's Like Father, Like Son, um, the, the Game's Dreams. There's so many songs that, that pull from Biggie. And then uh, just his storytelling kind of just setting the scene of someone growing up in the hood and then, you know, becoming a a superstar that kind of you know it it, it it made people in the hood have self affirmation you know the want more and, and think the sky's the limit Miranda Johnson multimedia hip-hop journalist the one and only Lil C's thank you so much for sharing uh, such personal you, personal you. things for us we really appreciate uh, it, it. and DJ enough my brother always a pleasure to have you my love. and and I want to say this I've been talking to a lot of people over the years about the murder of Biggie as you know I'm a news reporter too if you have anything you want to tell me you know I do not reveal my sources even if I have to go to jail to protect them that's word <laughs> and you can contact me. You don't play. Yeah, it's true. Lisa. I'm not playing. Okay. I'm, t I'm telling you right now. If you have anything you want to tell me, if you have any piece of information together, murder cases are never closed. And I think that when we really value somebody as quite clearly the world values Christopher Wallace, notorious B.I.G., his mother, Valletta Wallace, she deserves justice. His children, his family, they deserve justice too. So if you have any information you want to tell me in confidence, you can get a hold of me on Twitter, on Instagram. My email's on my Twitter. You can call me, you can hit me up on the streets, stop me on the streets, whatever, and I will definitely look into it. And I'm gonna continue looking into it. We've talked to Russell Poole on this show. We've talked to Valletta Wallace on the show. We've talked to many other people on this show and we'll continue to do it. And let's see justice for the family. That's really the way to honor Big Papa. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us for this episode of Street Soldiers. Remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon. I hope it's your only weapon. I'm Lisa Evers. Let's push for peace. <laughs>